Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome friends and fans of thinktechhawaii.com to the second episode of our program, The Will of the People. We are talking about immigration issues today, and I am your host, Martha E. Randolph. We are going to be discussing the Trump immigration policies concerning the separation of parents and children from incoming undocumented immigrants who are crossing our southern and southwestern borders. My guest today, I'm happy to say, is immigration lawyer John Robert Egan. Some of you may recognize him from other appearances on Thick Take programs. John is a senior immigration lawyer for the Migration Council and has taught and developed humanitarian law and disaster management curricula for the Richardson School of Law at UH Manoa. He's done this for a number of years, and he was kind enough to offer us his perspectives on recent immigration issues. Welcome, John, and thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. Glad to be here. I'm so glad you are. Now, before we continue, I would like to remind everyone that today happened to be the day that the courts had given the immigration authorities as a limit to by the time they would have to reunite families would be today. Now, we are talking a massive number of people, and they are not going to meet that deadline. There will still be many people ununited with their children, especially there are some questions about the parents who were already sent back to their original homelands without their children and how they are going to get together. So, John, I'd like to pass that over to you and ask you at the same time to tell us what about this word uh, that they have put in the law about uh, the appropriate or allowable or permissible uh, children who are qualified for immigration. That's not the precise word. It is somewhere in my notes. But you know the word I mean. It's the one that allows them to say, this is, the, this is a person who qualifies for reuniting, and this is a person who does not. Well, it sounds like you're talking about the requirement that has been imposed by the Office of Refugee Resettlement to determine which children are eligible to be returned eligible to their was the own word. parents. The word was eligible. That, that's a pretty curious thought. If mm. you think about that, how does somebody who just saw this child for the very first time a few hours ago determine whether they're eligible to be given back to the parents that they were stripped away from? Not to mention the children who were taken away from their parents months ago, or their children who are very, very young, or possibly approaching adulthood in the ages of 17 or something of that nature. So there is no specific definition of the word eligible? Well, what they have imposed, and you really have to take this back a moment, why have they imposed any eligibility requirements at all? Indeed. The reason is to slow the process down, because they knew they were not going to be able to actually bring these kids back as quickly as the court had required. So they patched in some kind of an additional requirement. Well, we just can't give them back. How do we know this is really their parents? How do we know that their parents are not, uh, you know, in disguise as, as human traffickers? How do we know that they're not criminals? How do we know they're Indeed. children? Right. So, so they've made up all of this sort of stuff. We're going to take your child away, but we're not going to give that child back to you until you've proven to us that you really deserve to have your own child back. Hmm. Well, that's crazy. That's true. That's absolutely true. In fact, I believe I read today that um, in, in uh, USA Today, in an article from them, that um, some of these legalities that the immigration authorities working under Trump, who ha have used these as excuses for questioning the um, whether these are honest people, whether these immigrants are honest or are criminals, have been such minor infractions that in the normal course of events they would be settled with a $12 fine. Now that sounds to me a little bit like the word uh, eligible, uh, a way to create a criminal out of somebody who has not performed any crime except maybe they didn't dot their I or cross their T. Do you think that that sounds like another example of saying, hmm. we can't reunite these people because, oh, he's a criminal. He has to appear in court. He um, stole a candy bar. Or uh, he could not prove that the money he had on him was not uh, legitimate or something in that nature. Is this another excuse? Well, you can kind of sort of 
change this around, turn it around and, and think if someone came to your door, took your child away without your permission, by force, and then said, here's a long list of things that you have to do to prove that we can give you your child back. Hmm. What, 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 how does that make any sense? It doesn't. It doesn't to me. It, but it's a crazy idea, and, and it should be just identified as being indeed. ridiculous and unworkable. Absolutely. Maybe, uh, John, it would help our viewers if we give them some historical background uh, as to this entire concept of removing children from their parents. After all, there is a difference between saying, uh, this parent is abusing them, or this parent really is a gun runner or a, a criminal, and just arbitrarily removing children from their parents. And this goes back quite some time, although recently, with the No Tolerance uh, Directive in April, this became something involving thousands of people as opposed to just a few. Can you give us some background on that? And feel free to throw it back to me because I've got my notes. <laughs> well, there's a number of things going on here. First, the problem of people coming to our southern border and seeking refuge is not a new thing. No. That did not start with the current administration. It's been going on for quite a long while. So how have we dealt with that? Well, we actually have some international agreements that are important to keep in mind. The United States government is a signatory to the International Convention on Refugees and Stateless People. That says that anyone who comes to your border and asks you for asylum, you're supposed to actually let them in and make their case. The problem is that we then had quite a uh, sort of uh, crowd coming into the mm. border, and, and this you know, has been going on for years. It was going on in the previous administration as well, and they were trying to find ways to slow this down. Mm. Uh, one of the thoughts that, the, uh, frankly, it was the Obama administration uh, before the current administration said, well, you know, we could up the penalties for crossing the border without papers. And if we take those people and we put them in jail and they have children, well, that's kind of sending them a message that they shouldn't be doing this. Relatively quickly, the court said, no, you really can't do that. That's, you cannot punish children for the crimes of their parents. And the crime of crossing the border is a misdemeanor. It's not a felony. Why would you take such draconian action for such a small offense? So that happened around when? In 2014? Well... Or do we know? Do you have a, even a, a guesstimate as to the... Honestly, timeline. honestly, this has been going on for a while. They've been modifying it. The, the problem at the southern border goes back dozens of years. Uh, the, there was a, an agreement, the Flores Agreement, uh, in court in Southern California. Uh, that was during the Obama administration, and they said, no, you cannot incarcerate children with their parents. That's not an an appropriate way to deal with that. They tried to do family detention centers. There were problems there. Uh, but all of that was really small numbers. They were testing this out with relatively small numbers. It's the current administration that said, well, actually, we're thinking this is a really good idea. Let's expand it quite a bit. And that starts back from April uh, of this year, the Zero mm. Tolerance Program. And they were intending to send a strong message to people coming up from Latin America, no, you're not really welcome here, and we are going to treat you uh, in this very harsh way as a deterrent. Right. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, just to make sure you know, there are many links on our website which will take you to the facts and figures that we've been discussing. And I have some information for you here, which does tell us that the uh, children crossing alone, you might remember that, ladies and gentlemen, that the there was an influx, especially, I think, from Honduras, of children who were being targeted by local criminal gangs and being killed for no reason that we know of whatsoever. And they were coming in alone. Their parents were sending them 
as refugees or potential refugees to this country. And these rules in 2014 were even made more important because what do you do with a child who comes across the border illegally and throws themselves at your mercy? I would also like to clarify for all of you that there is a difference. You cannot classify everyone as an illegal immigrant just because they present themselves to your border uh, without paperwork that allows them to. In fact, that is how refugees usually show up or people who are applying for refugee status. They show up, they legally go to an entry port, they say, I would like to be a refugee. And the Trump administration is treating everyone the same as if they all somehow snuck into the country determined to live here without permission. And that is just not the case. Uh, John, do you know what the numbers are like? I believe when you and I were discussing this earlier, we talked about, I talked about certainly, why hasn't this issue made such a public uh, presentation before this? After all, I have not even, did not even know existed until the news came that the Trump's uh, immigration policies had caused the separation of as much as 2,500 families and then they were ordered to get these people back together. There are easily 500 or more children separated from their parents. There are parents who were sent back to their homes under the understanding that that was how they'd get their kids back. There is chaos here, and I'd like to know how does this happen and why is it just now coming to our notice? Why did the American people not realize this was going on before? I'm not sure that the American people in general didn't know. Uh, clearly, as the crisis has sort of grown and become more clearly uh, a problem, uh, yes, it becomes more newsworthy. But you have to remember that this administration has been throwing out chaos after chaos after chaos. That seems to be part of their, their plan, mm. is it, just throw stuff out there so quickly and, and change the news cycle. Uh, you know, there, there's a certain amount of uh, overload. Mm -hmm. And Frankly. just briefly, was there someone representing the Trump administration who was supposed to be overseeing this, who we can really say may be responsible for the level of chaos that has ensued? I think you were telling me about the name of the person that the Trump administration put in charge of all of this as being someone who definitely uh, supports this entire idea. Well, there is a person who was delegated the responsibility of handling the children. Now, the bureaucratic framework here is a little bit complicated, but when refugees come to the United States and have made a claim uh, and need some kind of housing or, or other social support, there is an Office for Refugee Resettlement. Uh, which is not actually within the Department of Homeland Security. It's not under Jeff Sessions and the Attorney General. It's under Health and Human Services. Mm. Uh, so it's a, a little bit of a uh, disconnect. Do you remember frankly. the name of this gentleman who's in um, charge? Scott, I think his last name is Scott. Um, he, you, I, if you have in your notes, you're welcome to look at them. We uh, are going to be going to break in a short minute, and I love people to know the name of that person before we go to break. And for you to make a note of it, ladies and gentlemen, and please Google it and find out more about this individual. His name is E. Scott Lloyd. Uh, he was a uh, uh, sort of a, a conservative advocate for, actually, curiously enough, he had nothing to do with refugee work prior to his, this nomination. Uh, he had been uh, working in... Uh, you know, the pro-life movement, huh. uh, and first came to know one of the very first things he did in his job dealing with refugees, m you may recall the case uh, early, uh, later part of this last year, early part of this year, where uh, a young female migrant had been raped on the pro in the process of getting to America, uh, became pregnant, and wanted to abort yes, that. Yes, I do remember well, that. Well, that was him. Ah. The fellow who said, no, we're not going to allow that, uh, this, this young woman is going to have to carry this child to uh, birth. And, and eventually the court stepped in and said, no, that's not really your job to make that decision. Uh, but that's the guy. That, hmm. That's him. And, and he is, he specifically wrote an order that any decision about releasing these children back to their 
uh, families had to be vetted by him personally and uh, case by case and he had to sign off on every reunification. Well, 3,000 of these, uh, that was just never going to happen. It was, yes. just, it, was, it was simply a way of stopping the program from succeeding. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, that seems to me to be a situation where this could open the U.S. government to all sorts of lawsuits uh, based on violations of human rights or violations of international agreements or abuse of all sorts. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get to this completely before the break, but if we don't, we will return to this subject. John, surely some of these actions do violate agreements we have made with the international community. Is that so? Or am I just thinking that we pay mouth uh, credit to these various agreements and we never actually became signatories of them? No, not at all. We, we are signed to any number of different agreements that relate specifically to this. Uh, for example, the, the, the Convention on uh, Refugees and Stateless People. Uh, has a very clear statement about how we treat people when they arrive at our borders for this. However, you have to really understand, that's not like a law here where, you know, if you get caught speeding, a police pulls you over and right. takes you out, and if you're drunk, they take you to jail and put you... No, there's no, there's no international police that go around and arrest the President of the United States for doing a stupid policy Absolutely. like this. Absolutely. It, there, there's no enforcement. Okay. So, so there, there's no method to have those types of international agreements bite in, in a situation like this. Okay. And, and if you really think about it, uh, why would anybody want to do that? Uh, the people who would enforce the rights uh, of the refugees in this situation have to be other signatory parties exactly. to that treaty. Exactly. Now, which signatory party to that treaty wants to stand up and kick Donald Trump in the knee? I don't think anybody's planning to do that on behalf of these people. Uh, and, and if you think about it, for example, this body of law that relates to how we treat refugees is uh, administered through the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Mm. Uh, okay, they are responsible for some 30 to 50,000 refugees around the world right now. And who is their major funder? The United, United States. States of America. Of so do you think Antonio Guterres, the, the High Commissioner for Refugees right now, wants to pick a fight with his major funder. He certainly would not. Uh, I think we're going to be going to break soon, and so let's, before we go further with this, let's just go to our break, and then we can come back and follow up with this, because I think most Americans would think that if your child was taken away from you, you would certainly want to take someone to court and see if you could get some money because they did it. And I don't know even if that's legal or possible, but I'd like to come back to that after the break. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a brief break and we will be back in just a few uh, seconds. And please take this opportunity to look at some of the links that we have posted online and get some background information and do as much research on your own as you wish. Thank you very much. When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger. And hungry mornings make tired days. Grumpy days. Bleh kind of days. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. When we're not hungry for breakfast, we're hungry for more. More ideas. More dreams. More fun. When kids aren't hungry for breakfast, they can be hungry for more. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just kind of scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Hi everyone, this is Martha Randolph and this is program uh, The Will of the People and we are talking about the recent immigration issues that have come to public notice that were instituted 
by the Trump administration. My guest today is John Robert Egan, immigration attorney with the Migration Council. When we went to break, John, uh, we were talking, I was talking about surely this is like this sounds like a lawsuit waiting to happen but it is true that none of these people are american they are citizens of another country they have the uh, the image of having been an illegal immigrant or a refugee who had not been granted status is it possible that there is any kind of legal option out there for them to take the Trump administration or the way in which the immigration issue has been handled recently to some kind of court to, well, make them pay, which is the money is less important than the fact that it gets brought to public notice? Or is this simply not within the realms of possibility for these people? Well, I think it's probably important to understand that the reason there was a court order to reunite these families is because there is already uh, a court action underway. Uh, now, that particular action was taken by the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. So, so that's not an action on behalf of each or any of the individual families. Uh, but there is a court action underway right now, and that is going to make a lot of uh, presidential rulings about how this is going to play out. Uh, you, you mentioned that some, make somebody pay. I, I don't think that's really what the initial problem here is. I don't think these families are looking to get money. I think they want to get their children back. True. And, and I think that's the first and most important thing. Uh, if there is punitive stuff to happen later, uh, well, maybe so. Uh, I don't think anybody's gone there yet. I don't think it's relevant at mm. this point. I, I think the first thing is there are still uh, it sounds, as of the news today, there are still over a thousand, possibly as many as two thousand children who are separated from their families because of the actions of this administration. And getting those children back into contact with their families is the most critical thing. All right. Yeah, I think that's pretty important. Now. Um I, I had to ask that question because we're a litigious society, and if this were happening to Americans, believe me, they'd want to do something about it uh, more aggressively. However, uh, what I would like to talk to you now about is, if possible, can we discuss the recent Supreme Court decision that uh, came down to respond to the Hawaii versus Trump challenge, mm -hmm. the third version? of the restrictions on immigration into this country, the Supreme Court basically decided that it was in the realms of the president's authority, um, which he has over immigration and national security matters, to suspend the entry of all or of certain classes of foreign nationals if he felt that their entry would be detrimental to the interests of the United States or that they needed to be properly vetted or anything of that nature. Now, can we clarify that a bit? Does this mean that the president can unilaterally decide who is allowed to come into this country and who isn't? Because I thought that immigration regulations were done by the Congress and there were a series of laws that get passed that indicate if there's numbers or quotas or who comes in or who doesn't come in. Well, yes to both of those. Yes, we do have laws. The laws are created by Congress. They set up quotas. They set up uh, a system. And the law specifically says that the, these laws are subject to uh, non-discrimination. And uh, that's the law. Uh, at the same time, there is another proviso in the same law, the Internet, uh, it's called the Immigration and Nationality Act. Uh, and, and in that law, it also says that it is within the authority of the executive, being uh, the president, uh, in times where there is a national security issue to restrict entry. So, so both of those things are true. Now, what is a national security issue? That becomes a, a really important question. And we do have precedent for that. Uh, interestingly, in this very same uh, decision that came out from the Supreme Court, uh, the court said that it was overruling a previous case, the Korematsu case, mm. which has a lot of resonance here in Hawaii. 
Uh, that was the case that put Japanese Americans, many of them citizens, uh, into detention camps in the Second World War. Hmm. Uh, and, and in that case, they used the, uh, the theory that there was a national security issue in order to justify in the national security uh, the detention, you know, remove all these people from their homes, put them in detention camps. The Supreme Court said that we're overruling that because that was clearly wrong, but what we're doing today with Donald Trump is actually okay. Well, most people who are looking at this don't really understand how that can be both true. Mm. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons that the Korematsu case uh, has gone down in history as being a major mistake. The, the Supreme Court made an error by ruling in favor of the Roosevelt administration in supporting the, the incarceration of U.S. citizens on a national security basis is that in the years after, research has uncovered that it was false. The information saying that the Japanese American community was somehow a threat to national security has been proven now historically mm -hmm. to be bogus. It was not true. It was not true at the time they did it, and they knew that it was not true. Hmm. So what is history going to say now yeah. when we years go by and we find out that actually that the doctors and engineers and psychiatrists and, and all the different technology people from these Middle Eastern countries that are living here in the U.S. Uh, never were a security threat to the United States, and yet we used national security as the rationale right. for overstepping in this kind of a way. And actually, Robert, that, um, John, John, that uh, is something, a question that I am interested in, because there was no attempt, as far as I can see, for the government to prove that their assertion of these individual nations were a direct threat. They were not required by the courts to validate their statement, to prove it in any way, before the Supreme Court decided that the president has that power. And yet, from what you're telling me, there is a precedent, a legal precedent, that challenged a ruling uh, based on the fact, or overturned a ruling based on the fact that there was no proof. So, well, I'm, let, I'm not let a me lawyer, so I'm there. a little confused. Let me interrupt you there. Don't read more into what the Supreme Court said than what is on the paper. They said we overruled it, it was a mistake, full stop. They okay. didn't go into all of the reasons why they were overruling it, it was what they called dicta. Dicta means something that the Supreme Court says in a ruling that isn't really related to the issue at bar. Okay. So at bar was the question of a Muslim ban. In their decision, they also said, and by the way, we overrule Korematsu. They didn't go in and talk about all of those other things. You have to find those in other sources. So, so no, there is no direct, uh, they don't articulate this as a contradiction in their history, they are actually saying, consistent with our practice of fair play, we're, you know, we, we were overruling that one, but this one still is good. Okay. All right. That's, that's very clear. Uh, I tend to like to get to the essence of these matters. Uh, John, I need to thank you very much for coming today. We needed a legal perspective on many of these issues, and you have provided it. But we're going to close the show now and get everyone ready for next time, and I hope you will appear again, as I think we're going to have a lot of legal issues to look into with the Trump administration. I have a suspicion that that's correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. So, ladies and gentlemen and viewers and fans and folks, I want to thank you for looking in today on this immigration issue program. Uh, the Will of the People will be back in two weeks, and my guest at that time will be Blake Oshiro, who will be representing Compassionate Choices Advocacy Group. This is the group that recently got the governor to sign HB 2739, which is the Our Care, Our Choice Act into law, which does authorize the right of a mentally stable, terminally ill adult to ask for medical aid in dying. This has been a very contentious issue, and I hope you will join me in two weeks to find out more about it. Thank you very much, and we will see you then.